Welcome to Fort Worth 148's podcast, where we meet to discuss Masonic topics and strive to build value in the Brotherhood. The opinions and statements of the participants do not represent any positions or stance of any Grand Lodge or Lodge, and are solely the viewpoints of the participants. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. This is Rhett Moore, past master and current secretary for 148. This is Billy Hamilton, senior steward for 148. And this is Gabriel Yagish, master mason with uh, Fort Worth 148. It's been a busy, busy time. We're in the middle of the Scottish Rite degrees. Uh, You know, there was a funeral on Monday. You know, I was in two different organizations on Monday evening. You know, uh, it's uh, things are getting packed and... And Rit and I are almost done with Scottish Rite degrees. So this yes. Saturday, we're going to get that 30th, 31st, and 32nd degree, and it's going to be great. It's um, Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to getting my first funny hat of Freemasonry. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh, you know, come join come join us in Knight Templar. Then you can have an even funnier hat. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, Oh, I'm, are you going to go early? Uh, Cause I'm, I'm yes. thinking about going, uh, like first thing in the morning as well to reseat, to revisit the degrees that I've already seen. No, no doubt. Um, but for me, I'm going for breakfast and everything because it's just a chance to get to talk to some of those guys that are well steeped in Masonic lore. Yeah. There's a wealth of information in the Fort Worth Valley. Yeah. So do you want to jump in on uh, discussion questions? Let's do it. All right. So the first discussion question that I have for today is, what are the odds of me getting blackballed? And it's just a general, <laughs> it's a general sort of question, like for the general applicant, like what are the odds of an applicant getting blackballed and what are some things that might go into that? Man, like, that's a good question. I mean, because I don't know why you put odds to it. Because, I mean, we haven't blackballed a candidate in a long time, but uh, we haven't accepted petitions. You know, we told guys this isn't the right time to come back later, mm-hmm. kind of thing. Uh, but I would say, out of all the petitions you get, blackball or not accepted, uh, you know, only. 80 to 85% of the petitions you get should make it to master Mason or inquiries. I should say. Yeah. As and opposed that, to that's formal it. ones. Yeah. yeah. That's it best. So just to kind of break it down, the guys that email us off the internet out of 10 of those, you know, eight at best should make it. Yeah. And we're not ruling that as like a general statistic or anything like that, but you know, just, from personal experience, something's going to be up with like 20% of people. <laughs> yeah. Cause it doesn't always, and very rarely does it fall on character mm-hmm. uh, to where we're like, this guy can't be a Mason. Yeah, uh, I, would, I would say it's usually it, conflicts. Yeah. And I would say that generally speaking, your are uh, you know, if we want to talk about odds, which is kind of a weird way to discuss blackballing, your odds of getting blackballed are very low because you know, if you're, we're taking your petition and everything like that, and you've seen an investigative committee, chances are, if you've gotten to the investigative committee, we already kind of trust you. So should, or at least anyway. if a lodge is following best practices, but that's a totally different discussion. So, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. That's it. It is extremely rare to blackball somebody who's been investigated. And nowadays it is. Yeah. Um, so the next question, discussion question we have is, uh, for you, because this is in your corner of the court, uh, what kind of information is kept in lodge records? Oh, well, we've got your blood type. We've got your medical records. (laughs) Got the name of your firstborn child in case we ever need to cash in. (laughs) The only thing that we really keep on file is any, um, any form you turn into us. So your petition, of course, the birth certificate that comes along with it, uh, say it took more than a year and you have to do a petition to advance, that stays on file. If you're issued a certificate of good standing, you know, aside from that, there's minutes 
um, to where in the old days, there used to be a lot more record keeping with waiver of jurisdictions and things like that, that have just kind of fallen that tradition or law doesn't stand anymore. Yeah. So I think nowadays we're a lot more lean and mean makes life a lot easier. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of stuff is stored on your, on the secretary's database, kind of your Masonic bio tells you when you are initiated, passed and raised your officers, you've held positions, you've held, if you went to grand lodge or all in life program, all that kind of stuff. And some of that, as we'll see later in this episode is actually kind of important. So, but, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple database in terms of like what it's not extensive. So, um, we actually don't keep that much information. Um, sometimes I wish we kept a little bit more information, but that's more of a different sort of thing. I, I like to see lots of history and rich details on who our members are and things like that. And with very basic record keeping, that's hard to maintain, but it's also very difficult to maintain because there's so much information. So it, it, there's a certain point where you lose returns on it. No, and it's no doubt. And the thing about the information we have now is it's not very accessible because if you were to ask me to go find a petition from 1940, it would be under God's 50 feet. boxes, you know, uh, piled all on top of each other somewhere. Yeah, and that's and no why telling digi- what order. digitization is so important. But mm-hmm. digitization itself is a mountain to climb. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a real task. All right, so no doubt. Let's move on to the main episode content for today. Uh, today, you know, this is uh, episode thirty-eight, Masonic funerals, <sighs> and this episode. Uh, Rit and I kind of talked about this, and we kind of want to revisit this one in more detail at a future date. This is meant to be a very cursory overview of the Masonic funeral, um, kind of as it pertains in Texas, uh, basic things you need to do uh, to kind of uh, prepare for it, um, your duties as a brother of the lodge of the deceased brother. Um, maybe some things that we notice in other jurisdictions that are different from Texas, um, anti-masonry at the graveside, maybe some issues with, uh, your, your pastor or your family or things that might kind of go sideways and then just kind of general lessons learned from the funeral. So that's kind of my brief overview for yeah. our discussion. So um, oh, I, I would ask you if you've ever seen one, but I know you have cause yeah. <laughs> I've been to a few with you. Yeah. And, uh, it's yeah we've been to a couple together um the last the last funeral for a brother that I went to was actually this past Monday uh, but it was not a masonic service because um uh they actually had the service in the funeral chapel and I showed up I did not have the opportunity to come by the funeral chapel or yeah the memorial chapel or whatever uh, I had to arrive directly at the graveside um, so I missed that part, but, um, I think the last Masonic funeral I went to, uh, was probably Paul Solomon's. So, mm-hmm. and that was earlier this year. Rit, how many Masonic funerals would you say you've gone to or f- Masonic funerals or funerals for brothers? Not necessarily Masonic in nature. Uh, let's see, uh, probably 10, 12 at least. Yeah. And I've, I've worked in like six of them. Yeah. And I've been, I've, so come Thanksgiving, I'll have been a master Mason for a year and I've already been to five funerals for brothers, I think I want to say. Yeah. And then I, I think two or three were of which were Masonic. So it's kind of an interesting experience because I, you know, I, one of the last things that I expected when I joined the fraternity was to start showing up to a lot more funerals than I'd ever been to in my life. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I was going to say that if you haven't seen one, you know, you should, you should definitely see it in action. Uh, it's one of our better rituals, especially for the public, for sure. Yeah, and we have a couple of uh, public ceremon- ceremonies that are open uh, to everyone. You know, we've got uh, 
cornerstone layings. Uh, we've got open installations for officers. We've got some some educational programs that we offer are open to the public as well. A couple other little things like that, uh, like the um, what is it, the Lamar Award? You know, <laughs> for cert, you know community service. Those are open to the public. Um, but uh, the most important publicly open ceremony, I th- in my opinion, is the funeral. Uh, yeah, and for many non Masons, that'll be their first um, experience with Masonry. No, absolutely, and it goes through a lot of our symbols and things like that, to where they get a a good brief overview. Um, but it's it's deep, it's good stuff, and it it's something that we have in common with every civilization, every group. Um, I mean, uh, one kind of an interesting note from the. Um, the Texas monitor was that uh, the the direct quote is uh, the custom of interring the dead with some solemnity is general among all nations, whether savage and ignorant or civilized and enlightened. And that's from page 188 of the Texas uh, Masonic monitor. And it's kind of interesting because like, and I was doing some research on this. You look back and even Neanderthals who we characterize as the most base of savages, um, even Neanderthals practiced funeral rites, which like, that's amazing. So it, it's something that humanity has shared ever since the dawn of intelligent human life, basically is, yeah. you know, and that's just something incredible to think about, you know? No doubt. I love the way they put that. <laughs> and so From Ignats to Smarties. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, the Blue Lodge has a Masonic funeral service. Uh, The Order of the Eastern Star has a funeral service. So usually, you know, uh, a male member of OES will receive a Masonic funeral service um, because you have to be a Master Mason to be in the Order of the Eastern Star if you are male. Uh, So he'll usually get a Masonic funeral service. But the, uh, the Order of the Eastern Star has their own funeral service that they most often confer upon their female members, which I thought was really interesting. Hmm. And then uh, the uh, Commandery of Knights Templar also has a funeral service. And so kind of the big difference between the Blue Lodge service and the Commandery service is that um, the Commandery funeral service is distinctly Christian in nature, where uh, the Masonic funeral service is not Christian in nature. It's just kind of a general spiritual sort of moment. It's for everyone. Yeah. Do they do those much? I've never even heard of those. I've never seen one in action, but uh, I mean, if I get the opportunity to go to one, I'll tell you about it. Um, I've heard that it's really cool. That'd be interesting. Um, So one of the things that we have for Masonic funeral services is the Lodge of Sorrows. Yes. And so for those of y'all that aren't familiar with the Lodge of Sorrows, it is, um, it is, we have ritual openings for each lodge. So for the entered apprentice fellow craft and master Mason's lodge, before we can meet for business, we have to engage in a ritualized opening and close it with a ritualized closing. There's words, ceremonies that go along with this. One of the, and I always say there's four lodges because the fourth lodge is the lodge of sorrows. It, it, it is singular though. Okay. Oh, lodge of sorrow. Lodge. Yeah, Lodge of Sorrow. Oh, I, I mistyped that in my notes then. <laughs> so the Lodge of Sorrow is almost indistingu- indistinguishable from a Master Mason's Lodge in terms of ritual. Um, mm-hmm. The big distinction, though, is that you like you cannot open a Master Mason's Lodge to conduct funerals. The only lodge that is permissible to open and close for the business of conducting funerals is a Lodge of Sorrow. Yeah. And, you know, in the old days, they used to have to open that every time. So if someone passed away, they had to go to lodge, open that bad boy up, mm-hmm. go to the funeral home, do the business, come back mm-hmm. and close the Lodge of Sorrow. And that's still permissible within now, Texas. We don't yeah. we don't have to do it that way, but we can. Yeah. And I was thinking, do you think we should go back to doing a Lodge of Sorrow for each individual funeral? Or do you think we should do it more of open it at the beginning of the year and leave it open? No, I mean, because it used to be when you go, when you walk to Lodge and the few, the cemetery was 100 yards behind it, that's easy. But now it's a 20 minute drive or could be further. So I think what we've done to where we open it at the 
<clears throat> beginning of the Masonic year and it's open for the whole year is the way to go. Yeah. And, and you don't have to do it that way. Um, you can open it. Uh, you know, if, if you don't have a funeral open, uh, or if you don't have an occasion for a funeral, then you can just not open the Lodge of Sorrow until later in the year. So you might open it in like November or something like that, and then just leave it open for the rest of it. I was reading up in the monitor and you're not required to open it right off the bat. Mm -mm. Um, but then basically what we do is we call the lodge from labor for the purpose of conducting Masonic burials. And so we just say, okay, we're not closing this lodge, but we're taking a, a, you know, a time out here in the lodge room and, uh, going to go do the burials. Um, yes. I mean, cause it would be cumbersome to have to go there every time, uh, with things being so far spread apart, which reminds me of another thing, you know, cause when you are closing that, lodge of sorrow you're supposed to put into the minutes of that lodge of sorrow that all the funerals that you conducted but if someone else conducted it for you like the masonic service bureau in our district does a lot of them uh you, you don't put that in your minutes interesting okay i didn't yeah know that. yeah it's just when your lodge actually performs the service so now if your lodge gets the team together and you put it all together but someone else does the lecture you would still get credit for it but when you basically when you farm it out it would go in that lodge's minutes right and so there's also an anti-burial service which is i think that's optional i think right that's supposed to be read when you open the uh, Lodge of Sorrow. Okay. my And I do know that like, reading it once when you open it can serve as the anti-burial service for all burials during the year. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, kind of to touch on the history of the Masonic burial in uh, our history here in the United States, um, one of the important this is from freemasoninformation.com in an article that was uh the masonic funeral service done well uh, it's from 2011 and it, it's just a it's just a very short note on this but it said obtaining permission to ceremoniously bury members of the black community in the 1770s was a major concern of prince hall and prompted him to seek out freemasonry to help him accomplish this end it has said, been said by many scholars that way back in the operation of early English and Scottish lodges, before the formation of the Grand Lodge of England, a funeral ceremony was part of their modus operandi. So it, 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 that kind of really speaks to how important and integral to our existence as a lodge that the funeral service is because if you know and you know if we take this at face value and say that that is one of the reasons why prince hall sought out to become a mason that it is one of the most dignified memorial services i've ever seen and it's a it's a very good way to put somebody to rest and um for a brother like prince hall who was a member of a marginalized community um that would have been an, a very excellent way to try and find a, a a way to remember uh, the passed away members of that community. So I thought that yeah. was kind of interesting. Uh, but, no doubt. I mean, because like you said, everybody from the dawn of consciousness, basically intelligent man's wanted to bury their dead with respect. Yeah. And so we've also got a bunch of rituals for this. Um, the most common ritual that's used for funeral services, which is, I think the only one I've actually heard um, at the funerals that I've been to, uh, that's the revised Sam Canty uh, Masonic bur uh, Burial Service. And I think that's from the 1950s is when that was revised. Um, Why did you say rev Oh, I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see it was. That is the most common. I think there's three, right? There's actually a ton In the monitor, of them. anyway. There's a ton of them. In the monitor, there's three of them, I think. Um, but there's uh, a, what happened was that for the purpose of purposes of simplicity and consolidating ritual, not all of the services uh, were considered uh, to more uh, well, considered for inclusion in the monitor. And it actually says on page uh, 189 of the monitor, 
However, to promote greater uniformity in the future, for brevity, and to reduce indecision and confusion in selecting an appropriate service, one anti-burial service, one graveside service, and two memorial services are included in this monitor. It is emphasized that this is not intended to discourage those brethren who have expended much effort in learning one of the services not included herein. All the other approved services, the Sayers, the Nat Washer, and the original Sam Canty, together with instructions, anti-burial services, processional, and special graveside activities, as originally adopted, are available from the Office of the Grand Secretary. So, huh. we've got a gazillion different rituals for burials, but not all of them are in the monitor. You may want to contact the Grand Secretary if uh, you're interested in uh, going uh, going with something different. And yeah, so- I know my... Uh- Sam Levesey, my mentor, he m- took pieces from two or three different ones. And it was the bulk of it was the revised Sam Canny, but it ha- he had a few different parts in there that he, he liked from other that he put in there. Mm-hmm. So you can get, you can get free with that. Yep. What I like about the fact that there's several different services is it's also very respectful of the family's wishes. So if they want to do something at the graveside, there's something in, in the monitor for that. If they want to do something just, you know, privately, there's something for that. True that. And that's, then that's very important because sometimes um, the brother might want something that the family doesn't want. And that can be very difficult to reconcile. And, that kind of gives us a great launch into preparation. It's one of the most important things we can talk about as individual brothers with our families. Um, a Masonic funeral is held at the request of the brother or at the request of his family. Uh, so the lodge has to know. If we don't know that you want a Masonic funeral, we can't give you one. <laughs> so, well, And that brings up a good point because... When it comes down to the time to actually perform that, so let's say, Gabe, I tell you I want a Masonic funeral, and when it comes time and my family and my wife are saying, no, he's not having a Masonic funeral, well, guess who's not having a Masonic funeral? Because in the end, it is the family's wishes. You know, uh, it's their time of bereavement, so it's not anything that we can force on the family. So. A good example is a lot of times families don't want the Masonic service done inside the church, Mm -hmm. but they'll allow us to do it at the graveside or vice versa. It may be so hot. They don't want us to do it at the graveside. They want us to do it there inside the chapel, church, wherever we may be. Mm -hmm. And you need to be ready to conform to those wishes. Absolutely. And we may also have alternate preparations done because there are, there are adjustments to the ritual in cases that, in the case that, for example, you're cremated, uh, we have small minor alterations to the ritual because we do talk about the coffin and the lifeless body and things like that. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, for example, you know, we, uh, you know, saying that instead of his body to the earth, we might say his ashes to the earth or whatever. And it's, it's very minor, but we do have little adjustments here and there for inside, outside ashes, you know, body sometimes nobody um yeah sometimes we may be doing a, a memorial service for somebody that that who whose body was not recovered and so obviously that's kind of a worst case scenario but um you know some there has been occasion in no. the past to do that so yeah because i mean i know and in, in the one we do you sprinkle sand and mm-hmm. when we did it inside for my grandfather we dropped rose petals as opposed to dropping sand on the carpet. <laughs> yeah, and I believe I've seen some California ritual that uses rose petals even at the gravesite as well. Um, yeah. I may be misremembering that, but I, I remember reading something about, like, for a gravesite service, they use rose petals instead. Oh, you know what? That reminds me, too. So when you go to a Masonic funeral, if you've got a evergreen, you know, that you can get, and usually there's one at every cemetery, you grab you a piece of that, it's typically cedar, and pop it in your lapel spot. Usually your, your lapel, uh, your lapel, uh, little buttonhole or the, uh, coat, uh, the, the Hank, the pocket square pocket. Um, it's a good spot for it. There's some key steps to, for you before you're passing to prepare. Um, the first thing is to put your wishes in writing. Uh, you need to have that 
on concrete. If it's not written down, it doesn't count in most cases. Um, you need yeah. to give a copy of those wishes to somebody that will handle your affairs. Um, and then you need to keep a copy with your valuable documents. But most importantly, um, after having a written version of this, you have to tell people in person, verbally, because many of these to- many of the times uh, the papers aren't found until after the funeral. Like I see a yeah. lot of times people say, "You remember, put it in your will that you want to be buried masonically." That doesn't work no, you because should, don't. most of the time the will is read after interment. So and. That's not going to be uh, something on somebody's – the front of their mind. Yeah. The, like they they may not even know it was an option for you to get a Masonic burial. And so by the time all the plans are made and the brethren might hear about it, it's you know, late. it's kind of hard for us to come and insert in. Yeah. And in hey, that, in, he wanted a Masonic funeral. <laughs> Yeah, and in that case, if the family does find out too late, there is an option for us to do a memorial service in the lodge um, or at the graveside after things are said and done. Um, I believe there are some ritual... I know there's one for the lodge room that that can be done, and I think there's one for post interment stuff that's at the graveside, but I'm not really familiar with that. So Yeah. And if I might, too, uh, not only is it important for the brother to let the lodge and his family know about it, but I think it's also important on the other side for the the lodge or if you're with one of the other appended bodies to make sure that they keep in touch with the family about such things. Uh, My wife's grandmother was Eastern Star for about 70 years, and her wish, and it had been communicated to her chapter that she wanted to have an Eastern Star uh, funeral service. and um, it ended up getting overlooked. Whoever in in the chapter was supposed to handle it had dropped a ball. And as a result of that, you know, it, it's created a little bit of discord among the family that, uh, you know, her sisters and, uh, you know, her, her daughters were are all very old Eastern star. But now the, some of them are actually considering committing. And you're talking about 50 year members wow. uh, simply because of, of this being missed. Oh, yeah. That's, so that's definitely terrible. communicate that if you want it. Yeah. And one important thing to do as well, um, you got to you got to know what you want people to talk about at your funeral. So I was reading about this and, and basically, you know, try and keep an autobiography of sorts. Like, you know, you've got your basic stuff like date of birth and what religion you are, um, your family members, who you were married to, who your kids and grandkids are. Um, that's basic records. You should always pretty much keep that on, you know, somewhere. Um, but you should also include stuff like, uh, favorite hymns and songs. Um, uh, you should have that anyway for regular funeral services, um, fraternal involvements. You know, were you, were you a Mason? Were you also a member of the Elks? Were you in the Rotary? That kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> important work achievements, you know, like, Hey, if you did something in your career that you're proud of, include that, you know, we'll, you know, uh, that can be mentioned, you know, there's a, there's a spot in the Sam Canty ritual, uh, for a short eulogy. And that's part of what we talk about, you know, things that you were proud of, um, write down stories about your family, uh, important memories, uh, the things that made you, uh, you, and so uh, just keep a little autobiography of some sort. I mean, it's something most of us don't want to think about. But if you were to pass right this minute, how would you want to be memorized you know, or memorialized, right? Well, and it's a great exercise, especially for Masons. I mean, mm-hmm. we're taught to, you know, contemplate death on a regular basis. And that's a great way to do it. <laughs> yeah. And recently, um, I don't know if Billy, uh, cause Billy, you were on the, on the degree team. So I, you may not have been present for that, but we were written. I were recently part of a, um, uh, an educational function where we had to fill out a worksheet. And one of the questions was, um, who do you want to talk to before you die? And like, what do you want to tell them? Um, and like, so if you were going to die, like right now, who is the last person you to reach out with and what do you what do you want to tell them and i think that's a that's an incredibly useful question um to ask yourself all the time yeah 
And so, no, no doubt, because uh, it'll remind you what is important. Because nobody will honestly say, you know, I just want to take my Bentley for one more spin. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now, some people really love their cars. <laughs> No, yeah, you're right. They get wrapped up in the material, but well, you know, all good men said in the cru- end. You know, there is something to be said for cruising with the windows down and the music up. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. That's such a great exercise, and and I love that. That's part of Scottish right too. Is that uh, you know, it has that exercise. That what messages would you like to leave behind? What is it that you what is it that you're proud of in your life, and what is it that you wish you could have done better? Yeah, I found that my answers were a lot shorter than I was expecting them to be. That was kind of interesting. I thought I'd have longer answers and more complicated things to say, and it ended up being all very simple. You know, when presented with that, you would like to be able to respond with something you know deep and profound. But sometimes it's like I I really don't know. You know? Yeah. <laughs> for me on for me on the like, if you were dying right now, who would you talk to, and what would you tell them? I was going to be like, oh, man, there's so many people. And, like, I ended up just writing, like, the, what I realized was, like, I just wrote down my dad, and I just said that I love him. You know? That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? If I was no, going to die right and, now, like, that's who I would talk to, and that's what I would say. And that's all I need. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm saying, because if, if fundamentally for a good guy, it's going to go back to that person that they hold dear, you know, and made their life more meaningful. You know, that's the person that you're going to want to interact with on your on your dying breath. There's no doubt. I mean, just just kind of basic for a good person. Yeah. So, you know, kind of, you know, we we and we've kind of sidetracked from the main subject, but it's important. I guess what we're getting at here is it's important to think about these kinds of things, even if it's something as mundane as like picking a plot. You know, when you pick a grave mm-hmm. plot or if you want to pick out whether or not you want to be cremated or whatever. Think about these things. Be ready. Um, if you write these things down and prepare for these things, it makes life easier for your family. And that's no. part of the response. You know, it's part of the responsible thing to do. Absolutely. Because if you are going to be buried and you want to be cremated, I mean, uh, embalmed and all that, you better start saving now and have that in preparation for your family. Not that cremation is cheap. But Not, none of this is cheap. <laughs> Whoo, man, compared to some of the coffins you can buy, cremation's a lot cheaper. I think it's almost it's almost <laughs> cheaper to be big... bo- it's almost cheaper to be born than to die. <laughs> yeah. It makes me think of the Big Lebowski if you've ever seen that. Oh yeah. We may be bereaved, but we're not saps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's let's talk about our duty as brothers to the departed brother. Um that's one of the cool things to think about in um, in masonry is uh, what do we truly owe to our departed brothers? Um, and uh, one of them, I think, as uh, the final duty is the burial service, right? And somebody pointed out once that it was like it, it's part of all the lights, rights, and benefits of being a member of the lodge. I like that. Well, and I'm going to kind of flip the script because I used to think that way all the time. But after I performed a funeral, um, it kind of dawned on me that I wasn't doing my duty. It was this guy's last chance to give me something back from masonry because it's one of the biggest memories I have the first time I did a funeral. And it was like, you know, this guy's given me something even from the afterlife because masonry took on a whole new meaning for me after doing that duty. And it's the same thing with helping the widows. You know, the first time that I was like, well, that's a Masonic brother's widow. I'm going to go help her out when I did some plumbing work or something like that. The feeling I got done after that was like, I'm hooked. You know, where can I get more of this stuff? Mm. And, that's why I keep participating in funerals, you know, uh, because it's not so much my duty as it is a chance for that brother to give back to me from the the hereafter. And and that's and that's true. It, it's it's very connecting. Yeah, I mean, the duty part comes from 
memorizing the the ritual work. And you know, when it comes to the the funerals, there's two. You know, like the junior and senior warden have very small parts to where you can kind of break the ice and then jump into the big position. Because uh, once you do, I promise you, there's no turning back. Kind of an interesting thing with the discussion of duty is that there's these things in the Christian church. There's these what we call the, the seven corporal works of mercy. And these are duties that you have that like you should be doing as part of the church and uh, to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, redeem the captive, visit the sick, entertain the stranger. And the last one is bury the dead. And I thought that was really interesting because it's all of these things, you know, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, um, visiting the sick, redeeming the captive, entertaining the stranger. All of these things are very familiar to us as Masons, including that seventh and last point, which is to bury the dead. So you, you can kind of see the, the similarity that we have as um, if you look at the church as a organiz- a social organization, it kind of ties back to that all these different civilizations, societies, organizations, whatever, like everybody has a sense of duty towards burial, which is kind of neat. Um, but uh, one of the important things I wanted to talk about uh, is a turnout at uh, Masonic funerals. And, you know, Rit, we've been part of some very small Masonic funerals, right? No, without a doubt. Yeah, sometimes it's just the team that shows up. So, but we've also been part of some very large Masonic funerals. I went, you know, we went to one not too long ago where we had, oh, I want to say one and a half times as many Masons as there were actual family members there, you know, (laughs) and not for lack of family members because there was a large contingent there. Um, But I mean, this was a guy that, you know, everybody in our community knew and loved. And, uh, uh, showing yeah. up in force, I think, really does speak volumes to the family about how many people this guy made a difference for. Um, and uh, there's no doubt, da- no doubt. And I know it's tough because most funerals happen during business hours. But if it so happens that it falls and you can make it, get dressed up and go. You, I mean, it's one of those things you won't regret. It's like going to the gym. You know, it's hard to get off the couch and do it, but. You'll feel better afterwards. Yeah, and it, and it it takes less time than you think. I mean, disregarding driving time, it takes like twenty minutes. Like it's a short service. Um, yeah, and so obviously driving time may be part of your cable tow, but I mean, really, like honestly, if you can take two hours out of your day to include driving time, take two hours out of your day. Go go do the last the last service you can do for a brother and his family. Or I guess maybe no. not to his family because you can always keep up with his family, but it's a, certainly the last service you can do for him. Well, and I've heard the brother, I've heard a brother say before too, I, I don't like going to funerals. You know, that those, they kind of creep me out and it's like, well, in our profession, you, that's kind of point A, you got to get over that fact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you, uh, I mean, it's, I mean, kind of from the get go, I mean, we're, I I wouldn't say that from the entered apprentice degree, although we do touch on it, but certainly from the master's degree forwards, we are hounding you about death (laughs) and that it will happen to you. Um, If you're not comfortable with that fact, then you really um, need to take some time and, and, and figure out what you need to do to get comfortable with death. I mean, that's the real primary lesson of the master's degree. Um, but yeah, no doubt. I, and you know, for me, only one way, and that's get busy. <laughs> yeah. So take the time, go to the funeral. There you go. The problem, a, uh, you know, a lot of people, they have an issue with going to funerals because they feel almost like it is, you know, it, it's all about sorrow. But in a way, when you think about it, it's also a celebration of that person's life. Absolutely. To, to help turn around the the thought that, you know, it's a negative thing. It, it's not always negative. It, there's a lot of positive that goes into it also. No, absolutely. And especially depending on your religion as well, because here in Texas, 99.9% of the funerals I go to uh, have some kind of glorious afterlife to where it's like, you know, there's definitely some sorrow involved, but those things should be considered a celebration. And 
that's tough when it's they haven't lived the normal age, you know. But in the end, it's something that comes to us all. Mm -hmm. So part of you know, so it's it's reinforcing that positivity as well. So I, I think part of our do part of our duty um, as to the departed brother is not just to go to his funeral, um, and I would argue also not to go to funerals even when it's not going to be a Masonic service. If you have a brother who's requested no Masonic service or however that may be, but you are invited to attend his service, go. Really, I mean, really like that's, but go joyously, I think is a, a big key there. Like obviously that's going to not, that's not always an easy order, but to go joyously, I think is one of the most important things we can do. No, I mean, it's one of those things in the end that you got to kind of look at. I mean, it's what we're all about. It's that selfish selflessness. You go and you help the family in their moment of need. And when you leave that place, you're going to feel lifted up. You're going to feel re-energized. And it's, you're going to, somewhere along the way, you're going to pick up what's important in life. You'll be reminded anyway through that service. And it's going to lift you up. So I kind of wanted to move on and talk uh, briefly about other jurisdictions and some of the things that they do differently uh, from Texas that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, uh -huh. One of the important, uh, one of the neat traditions I've read about in uh, in an educational talk that Tom Spencer gave for the Scottish Rite here in Fort Worth was that in Mexico, the Master Mason's aprons are reversible. Because on the reverse side, they have, it's an all black apron uh, that's covered with, I think, white tears and a skull and crossbones well. on the bib. Um, so for when they open a Lodge of Sorrow, they reverse their Master Mason's apron. Um, that's that's what they do for the funerals. I thought that was kind of neat. So have you ever seen the apron before? Uh, Did yes. you Google it? The, the Mexican apron? Yes. Yeah. So are, is the skull actually crying the tears or is no, it just tears? It's oh. just, it's just like little white drops on the apron. Still cool, but yeah, <laughs> uh, that's legit though, man. I, I, I'm just, I love decorated mm -hmm. aprons. I, you know, I see guys that paint on them all the time oh, yeah. and I think that's just the coolest thing. And I really wish we had more options for that in Texas. <laughs> That's true. I mean, it, there's a lot of creativity that can be involved, and especially for something like, um, uh, so I do like the way that we do things in Texas for the, the funerals. Um, for example, here in Texas, um, it is not permissible to wear anything other than a plain white apron. Uh, yeah, th I love that law, though. Yeah, like that, if you are the... Legit. If you are the grandmaster, you still can't wear your grandmaster's apron unless you are conferring the funeral as the Grand Lodge. Like, you get the whole Grand Lodge team to get together and do the funeral. Um, yeah. Then you guys wear the, then they wear their Grand Lodge aprons. But as far as that goes, if it's just the Grandmaster and he's just in attendance, then he wears a plain white apron, which I thought, how humbling is that? You know, we talk about the hand of death making everyone equal and humble in the grave. And like, that's a real tangible expression of that, I think. No, and it looks clean when we're all out there in the same apron. You know, well, there's no discernment for the public. We're just there for the craft and that brother. Mm -hmm. um, so what about hats? Do we wear hats here in Texas? Yes. Yeah. So in... So usually the worshipful master will wear a hat for the funeral. In some jurisdictions, um, they don't wear, nobody wears hats. Um, in some jurisdictions, it's because uh, the families, uh, they, they said out of concern for the families who are weirded out by the Masonic function of wearing hats for stuff, they don't wear hats. Um, but in some jurisdictions, they consider the deceased brother to be the worshipful master of the ceremony. And so they say, well, he's the worshipful master and he's dead. So he gets, to, if he had a hat, he'd be the one wearing it. So we don't get to wear hats, which I thought was kind of interesting. Hmm. That is a cool take. Although, you know, a good point for that is, uh, I saw Steve Wolf do it, you know, to where he explained why he was wearing the hat inside. Cause outside it's a little more acceptable. If you're yes. doing it at the graveside, especially if but it's January inside, and it's 18 degrees outside. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> which we've been there, <laughs> but, uh, 
inside, it's it's even a good idea to get permission from the person running the church, whatever Absolutely. their title may be. Um, Just out of respect. Yeah. And it's good to explain it, too. Um, yeah. One of the things I wanted to talk about was um, this resource I got from mainmason.org. So the state of Maine, mainmason.org. It's in one of the resources called Hiram's Handbook, and it's how to conduct a Masonic memorial service. And they have six bullet points that are like um, absolute duties for the master to conduct. Um, and so one is immediately call on the widow of the family of the deceased brother and to express sympathy and condolences at the time of bereavement. Two, offer the assistance of the officers and brethren of the lodge. Three, determine whether a Masonic memorial service is desired or requested. Four, Make certain that you or a fully quiet brother is available to perform the memorial service. Five, arrange attendance of officers and brethren at the memorial service. Six, maintain contact with the widow and render whatever assistance is requested during the period of adjustment following the immediate period of bereavement, which I thought that was interesting. They're talking about like a true follow through. And I thought that that seems really important. Um... And they have eight bullet points to follow through with those six. So they say, you know, the first bullet point is to faithfully discharge those six duties. Um, The second one is to provide the best possible rendition of the memorial services. Um, The third is to uh, give consideration to the service and do not let it be interrupted. Like you have to have it continuous from beginning to end. Um... Fourth is to make certain the instructions contained with the uh, within the main Masonic textbook are fully complied with. So I guess here and for us it would be the Texas Monitor. Uh, fifth is to establish a telephone committee, so nowadays email chain, uh, charged with contacting brothers to attend. Talking about turnout. Um, sixth, be certain that lambskin apron, a lambskin apron and twigs of acacia are in hand for the service, and that white aprons in sufficient number are available for the brethren to attend. Um, seventh is to make sure there's a eulogy prepared and that the eulogy is acceptable. And eighth is to remember, uh, that you have to be aware. And in Maine, they have, they make a distinction between this. They have a funeral service and an evening memorial service. Uh, the evening memorial service, um, is, uh, generally used as a graveside service and the funeral service itself is more often done in the funeral home itself. So uh, they, they, this doesn't really no, translate uh, entirely to Texas, but it's some interesting stuff to consider. Well, a lot of it actually does, you know, because like <clears throat> immediate contact with the widow is important uh, if if it's an option. And then later follow up. I know when my grandmother or grandfather passed away, like six months later or a few months later, she got a letter from the lodge, you know, asking if she needed anything to reach out and then gave her a pamphlet about the TMRC. That's cool. You know, basically saying your your husband probably didn't tell you about this, but it's an option for you. Which that's important. It's not oh. some, yeah, it's not something you would do at the funeral, but if you maintain contact, it would you mm-hmm. you could do that. Um, and I another know that point some lodges that was in there, send flowers every year, that kind of thing. Yeah, or some kind of card or something, just to let them know, because you never know what yeah. what they may need. Um, another thing I wanted to make a point on that is that it said, get the most uh, qualified brother to perform the service, which if you've got brethren that have it memorized and can do it for memory, which is probably how it should be. That's great. But if you don't, all else fails, read that thing. Yeah. Just be there and do it. You got it. Uh, the main thing is just show up looking sharp, put on a good clean apron and, Show your support. Yeah. Uh, Another two other things that I saw that are not practiced in Texas, but that I thought were really interesting was uh, one of them was uh, having the Masonic history in triplicate. So, you know, when this guy was initiated, passed, raised, that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. uh, offices that he held, they printed out in triplicate. They give one to the family, one they keep with the lodge, and they put one in the grave. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then something else that I read about in, uh, it didn't specify what jurisdiction, but this was a funeral home talking about Masonic services. And so this, I guess this is from, um, their, their experience, but I couldn't figure out where the, these people were located. Uh, they were talking about how the worshipful master wears two aprons during the service. 
because he takes the one on top off and puts that on the coffin. Oh, that's legit. Yeah. So here in Texas, we reserve the brother's apron, like his apron, and we put that on his coffin. And yeah, see, that's something else you got to tell your family if you want to be buried with that or not. Yeah. And so um, the in this jurisdiction, instead of like having this guy's um, apron set aside and then putting it on the coffin, the worshipful master wears the brother's apron over his own takes it off and then puts it on the coffin, which I thought was fascinating. That is legit. That's cool. Yeah. I don't know why we couldn't do that here. Uh, probably. But it's already laid fit. on the coffin. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, in, in the Sam Canty service, there is a spot where the worshipful master pulls the apron up and takes it like he, he, he pulls it from the table or whatever and puts it on the coffin. But yeah. Um, uh, let's co- quickly talk about anti-masonry at the graveside. This is part of the preparation. You got to make sure that your family's cool with it, and you got to make sure that your pastor's cool with it. Because um, some ministers won't—they won't accommodate for that. Um, they're just super not cool with it, and a lot of times that is more out of ignorance than anything. But you know, it, it happens, it, and it's a real bummer. You got it, and that's. Again, the family's wishes. I mean, of course, even if the family wanted you to do it and the church wouldn't let you do it in there, you're going to have to figure out plan B, Mm -hmm. but just be ready to, you know, be ready to deviate like that because it should never be, well, we have to do it this way. You don't, you don't tell the family that in their time of (laughs) bereavement. And so for anybody that's wondering, this shouldn't interfere with your religion. We can't provide a way to salvation. That's between you and God. Um, something that I saw on, uh, Freemasons for Dummies, that's Chris Hodap's blog. This was published in, uh, June of 2011. It's about a a Freemason in Miami, Florida, who passed away at the age of 80 and was denied a Masonic funeral service by the pastor of his Baptist church. And so he'd been attending this church for like 30 years and his pastor was said, nope, sorry, no, you know, no good. Um, and this guy's name was brother, you know, brother Thomas Hamilton. He died and um he said and now kind of a discussion here this guy was a member of a clandestine lodge however as as brother hodap points out this shouldn't detract from what happened here you know he says um they wouldn't let us give him his last rites as a masonic brother um said the illustrious bobby meeks florida state grandmaster of the international free and accepted modern masons and order of the eastern star the pastor said he didn't believe in it um, and so when that happens, you find another church, said Brother Tony Williams. And so these guys, uh, even if they're not regular or anything like that, it they are still members of a community trying to grieve. And so sometimes you get shut down uh, by ministers that think they, they're trying to do the what's best. And it's, it's born yep. from an understanding. And it's our duty to be graceful and mm-hmm. figure out plan B <clears throat> yeah. without any kind of scene. Well, and even um, the the Florida state chaplain for the Prince Hall affiliated Grand Lodge uh, for Florida, like they're the regular Prince Hall Lodge. Uh, he said, uh, "No, I don't think that's the reason. To, that's reason to deny the family of a church member to have his funeral in the church." I understand a lot of the pro- pastors won't let the brothers come in and give the last rites. You know, um, it, some of the preachers think the church is there. It's theirs. It's not. It's God's house. The church belongs to the community. The people in the community uh, make up the church body. And so it's obviously, you know, uh, it's important to express our dissatisfaction because the church belongs to everyone. But it's yeah. also important to be that, respectful of that. So Absolutely. And that's something you can you can look into after the fact. Mm-hmm. Without so a doubt. There are a couple of... Um, readings that I wanted to do really quick as part of our lessons learned because we're running mm-hmm. short on time uh, this week and normally we we'll, normally we go a little bit longer but we're in, we're in a time crunch this week gotta but, get those um, kids there's an awesome awesome um, moment from the prayer one of the prayers that says the great creator having in his infinite wisdom removed our brother from the cares and troubles of this earthly life thus severing another link in the fraternal chain by which we are bound together 
Let us who survive him be yet more strongly cemented by the ties of brotherly love. Which I thought that was phenomenal because yeah. adversity, you know, should bind us more strongly together. You got it. But um, there's a lot of discussions to be had in here. And one of the, and this is from the Sam Canty service. It's an excerpt from the opening prayer. May we realize how weak is every human arm, and may we trust in thy might alone. And so that kind of teaches us to be prepared and and um, to really render trust into God, which is something we should learn right off the bat in the EA degree. But it's a good reminder at the end, too. You no, know, and the, it's the thing about it's 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 something you have to keep reminding yourself and you know, these kind of contemplations, they'll, they'll get you there. The fraternal quote uh, of the week uh, is, as stated in our funeral service, you can do nothing more of a material nature for the departed brother. Nevertheless, you can cherish his memory and offer the tribute of respect and love to the late brother's memory. Of even greater importance, you can be there to extend our fraternal sympathy to our brother's deeply affected and afflicted and sorrowing family in their bereavement. We must tell his loved ones and demonstrate it by our physical presence that our promises to be true to them are not hollow or empty words. We owe our brother something, and this may be the very last opportunity we will ever have to repay that debt. And I got that from masonsmart.com, and that is courtesy of the magazine uh, The Missouri Freemason. And so... That's good stuff. Yeah. It's so absolutely we, right. Quick closing thoughts, guys. Uh... I mean, for me, the main thing is, is just, I mean, understand the funeral for a brother. There's something magical that happens there. Get out, go do it. Um, you know, cause it's, it's just, it pays master's wages very well. It's not minimal master wages. <laughs> you're making 30, 40 bucks an hour when you go out there <laughs> and you're going to get a new depth for your, your fraternity. Yeah. Billy, how about you? Um, I I think my thought would be uh, for brothers out there, um, you know, the Masonic funeral rites is something that you are absolutely uh, entitled to ask for as a member in good standing. Um, start thinking about things like that today. Don't put it off until tomorrow because you may not have tomorrow, you know, and it's not something we all want to think about. But uh, we sit down, it prepare your family. Um, but I think it also gives you a greater appreciation for what you have today and what you've accomplished uh, when you go through that exercise. So, you know, do it sooner rather than later. Don't wait until it's too late. Yeah. It's and a good so, point. It's going to make it easier for everybody when you die if they know what to do. Yeah. And so all I've got to say is, hey, if you have the chance to go to a funeral uh, for a Masonic funeral, even if you're non-Mason, go to one. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever witnessed it's powerful. It'll give you a lot to think about. It's in certain ways, it's very life changing. Um, I do want to come back and revisit this subject on the podcast in the future in more depth with uh, more specific aspects of the funeral services because the ritual itself is very um, incredible. Yes, and, uh, let's we'll, do that. We we will come back at a later date and revisit this for y'all. Um, yes, there's some good stuff in it. But as always, you can reach us at www.fortworth148.org. We are at Fort Worth Lodge 148 on Facebook. Our email is info148 at fortworth148.org. And if you live in the 64th District of the Grand Lodge of Texas and you want to promote an event, please reach out to them at 64th.org. That's 64th.org. Well, it's been fun, boys. It's time to get the kids out. So this is Rip Moore signing off. This is Billy Hamilton signing off. And this is Gabriel Yagish signing off.